architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. This is the episode for Wednesday, 17th of June. And we are heading into summer and heading into a, another ongoing period of uncertainty around the virus, at least here in the United States. I hope everybody is safe and keeping well and looking after themselves and their loved ones. Um, Today I have a wonderful conversation for you with my very good old friends Nisha Matthews and Shomitro Ghosh uh, who practice out of Bangalore, who have a very refined, carefully cultivated modernist, modernist regionalist practice uh, that they have been doing uh, with great love uh, for at least the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, today's conversation, my conversation with them is in many ways very personal. We talk about uh, the journeys of our lives, uh, beginning with when we met uh, at the School of Architecture in Ahmedabad in the early 90s, uh, and then the many ways and events uh, that we have connected over. Uh, I gather their views on architecture, on modernism, on the continuing importance of modernism and of the relationship between structure and flexibility. It's a lovely conversation. I enjoyed recording this so very much, uh, and I hope you enjoy it too. Here we go. Well, let me just first welcome you to Architecture Talk. So nice to have you here. Thank you. (laughs) It's good to connect up with old friends from the good old days uh, yes. of uh, early 90s, yes. Ahmedabad Sept. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. At the canteen, yeah. <laughs> at the canteen, at the canteen, <laughs> with the completely politically inappropriate mural on it. Now when I look back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, uh, but I don't think any of that exists anymore. I think the yeah. whole canteen is gone. The campus is... Uh, yes. Yeah, there's a new one. Yeah, there's a new canteen. Vikram seen it. He's oh, you've seen, you've seen, seen it. When yeah. did you go No, 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 I haven't been. I haven't been. I haven't oh, been okay. to the post-reconstruction campus. Okay. 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 I went okay. last year. So I have seen the yeah. canteen. Of course, the library is older. Yeah. Yeah, and then quite a bit more. So how was how was it, Sumitra? Well, it's pretty gentrified, you know. <laughs> gentrified, <laughs> yeah. for, for the for the students to now wear uh, suits, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's become a sort of yeah blue suit university <laughs> versus versus when we were there, it was a still a late uh, kurta pajama jhola university no yes yes yes, yes. <laughs> yeah it's 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 yeah. changing yeah no i was going to say change is good but i think there's always um, i mean when you reflect on it there's always learning in those very you know in in undefined spaces if everything is so specified and you know sort of neatened up it's uh, learning becomes uh, you know difficult i think Learning becomes programmed. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Right. right. It but is learning. very strongly, strongly structured, actually. Yeah. Because I think this this time, I think uh, we are going to since all the classes are going online. Yeah. So I I think we um, should be doing a studio. Are you going to be um, doing a studio online, online in Ahmedabad? Yeah, yeah. Because this semester is supposed <laughs> to be online. So. I see, I see. Uh, That's wonderful. So I'm looking behind you and I know your practice. Uh, 
uh, and I know I can see the concrete ceiling behind you, and I can oh, yeah, see yeah. a sort of a distinct, sort of vaguely modernist, yes, Kubu, yes. almost Kabuzian photographs in the background. So, and, yeah, so that's yeah, that's the library <laughs> on the side. <laughs> but 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 you guys are still very much. Uh, Holding on to the great, uh, great torch of uh, critical modernist, late, uh, almost Cabusian, but really transformed, localized, regionalized, climatic, local conditions, material vocabulary. Mm. This is very much the um, Kurula Verki torch, isn't it? Yeah, he was our first teacher. Yes, and not, he, not mine. Not yours, he not yours. Yeah. But Nisha <laughs> yeah. is more important, Shumitra. We know that. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell us about Kurla Verki. Uh, and we are recording here, but the uh, director of uh, SEPT, famous SEPT University. Now it's university, then it was SEPT, Center for yes. Environmental yeah. Planning and Architecture in Ahmedabad. Please reminiscence about Kurla Verki. Yes. Can I go first? Yes. yes. <laughs> I think what I really value about him was the way that he enabled us to see beyond detail, beyond uh, the materiality of something and really get down to the crux of being able to think about something without being sort of overtly, uh, you know, uh, distracted, should I say, by, um, by facades and, uh, you know, all the embellishment that goes on and to be able to really, uh, you know, be able to come down to that fundamental, you know, sort of key that we look at as architects. And I think I really appreciate that we had him at the first year, you know, and he was, of course, extremely disciplined, extremely sort of structured in his approach. But because we had him at the first year, we kind of began to think along those lines. And then we had various studios, you know, which, which did not quite have the same approach. Uh, and we began to look at other things. But I think somewhere that little early grounding helped us to look at architecture beyond the obvious. And I, I really, really appreciate that. You know, he made it clear to us when we were unclear about what architecture was. So in some sense, the breaking out of that, you know, which happens when you get into practice and you start negotiating a lot of things was left to an individual practitioner, you know, but I think he established a very key foundational, you know, way of looking at things. And I, I really appreciate that. I mean, a very non uh, overtly formalist perspective. A kind of a perspective yes. that's insisted I mean, you know, on if, if you look at, Yes, yes. And you sort of see his approach in uh, I am Bangalore. You know, you see you see his hand there. Did he work you very know? closely with Doshi on yes, I am Bangalore? I, I yeah. think so. I think so. I yeah. think he was the key, uh, yeah. you know, the key architect uh, working on the project other than yeah. Doshi. It's very structuralist. You're right. Go on. Yes. But I think somewhere that little way of that little shift, you know, which is, which is because architecture can be so in your face, you know, you can get carried away with everything that you see without really, it's easy to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think having him in the early years, and of course, he, he did keep an eye out. I think he had, what I really like about him was that he had his eye on everyone. You know, and when I say that in terms of their development as architects, you know, so, um, he was also, I think, on a personal, at a personal level, he was a, he was a tall man, you know, not he physically was tall? tall. Well, tall in the sense of being very gracious, very, you know, very, yes, uh, yes. very gracious about your, your learning, you know. Yeah, I can, I can tell a little story. When I showed up there, what was it, in 1993 mm. or two, somewhere there, 92, <clears throat> maybe, 90, yeah. 91, maybe, I don't forgot forgotten. And, and I showed up as this young Punk, you know, from from <laughs> from the U.S., thinking he's very cool and spouting <laughs> Derrida and 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 feminist psychoanalytic French theory, yeah. 
yes. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, okay, you're most welcome. Uh, why don't you <laughs> run a seminar and you want to teach a studio? Right. Go ahead. You know, he was very open, very open. Yes. Although yes. I was the troublemaker, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're so glad you came in when you did though <laughs> <laughs> no but go on you were saying that uh work his legacy was uh, while he had a i think a very like you're saying a very uh rigorously thought through kind of philosophy yes. and approach to design which he yes. was very committed to and defended yes. to the to, to till 1 a.m. in the at, at night, <laughs> yes, uh, yes. easily and happily. And that's the other legendary thing about him is that he could uh, do crits till 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. and yeah. and was right. indefatigable as as an academic. Mm. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, he was very open to 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 discourse, uh, mm. to challenge, mm. uh, yes. to do other ways of thinking. Yes. Yes. And which I think corresponds to the thing you were talking about, what was the character and nature of the old Septec, Sept campus. Yes. And in many ways is characteristic of uh, uh, a lot of interesting architecture and urbanism, which is that there is, there is strong structure to it. And yet the structure has a lot of uh, uh, availability for uh, yes. looseness yes. and unexpectedness. That's right. And in mm -hmm. fact, that is precisely where the life of the project lies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I had a slightly different reading of uh, Varki as I saw him grow. <clears throat> and uh, because at 87, he came back and Nisha's batch was the first one. So I had, so I was doing my internship with Doshi and uh, so I, was spending rest of uh, all of all my time in school. So I said, um, so I met him and um, said that uh, I'm doing internship. So can I attend um, some of the lectures? So his answer was by all means, you can attend any studio you feel like anytime. Just yeah. tell them I told, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You can walk in wherever you like. But I saw him um, transform actually in, in some ways, especially in his architectural thinking. Oh, because really? I think Doshi is IIM Bangalore. He is heavily influenced and perhaps also detailed to an extent in terms of facades. And uh, proportions, Doshi is, of course, extremely good. Uh, but I think there were certain principles which I think Warki brought in. And that's not very different from what was happening in Turkey. Where he was uh, before that, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there is, uh, but gradually I see, I mean, I'm looking at uh, Warki's sketch, uh, which I have <laughs> um, of a project which I was working at uh, on in school. And uh, so there, I think Doshi's uh, experience for Warki was, was quite, I mean, for him, it was almost like a blessing because I think he had the clarity, but I think he did not have perhaps the, the realization of uh, living with unanswered questions. Mm -hmm. And so how uh, did he change? Yeah. So Doshi, I, I, and that's the perhaps reflects the time actually, that's the time like when, um, the experience of India, understanding India. We talk about uh, Khildani's book and yeah. all that time is... The idea of India. Time. Yeah, India changed around in the early 90s. With yeah, the, so there was a heavy bit of questioning happening and I, it was only throwing up interesting questions and I think that was the most important contribution of that time. No, but uh, how did uh, how did Varki change? Yes, so uh, what I see even from the sketches that I have here, uh, I could see that uh, his approach was uh, softening in in some ways, which was which would be less deterministic. Mm. Uh, it would set lesser guidelines to uh, control the design. So I think that perhaps is Doshi's influence on him. Mm. Doshi loosened him up. 
yes he did loosen him up and which is quite a, quite something i mean after uh, he must have come when he was maybe in his 40s i think and uh, quite strongly influenced with alto and also having worked in nigeria he had a very strong um, understanding a fairly straightforward way of doing things and which sounded very very logical and you know a process driven uh, approach to design um which had amazing clarity of understanding so first of all i think he had the capacity to abstract things and understand and almost make them as bullet points to deal with <clears throat> so yes yeah nisha how would you encapsulate the uh, the philosophy of the amzabad the pedagogical philosophy of the amzabad school in the late 80s and early 90s when when you guys were there and when i ran into you on the lawns of sept i think we were really looking at i mean you know similar to what how you summed up you know a part of our practice i think that um i think it was strongly modernist actually at the time when we were taught you know uh though she provided postmodern surprises you know when he talked about things when he discussed his projects mm-hmm. and as students it was uh you know uh it was to me it was a little uh shocking as a student you know sacrilegious <laughs> yes and you were brought up with you know these ideals which are going to change the world radically you know <laughs> so i i would say uh, and i think it it was strengthened i mean maybe it actually began i think i think things were much looser and more maybe unclear before the coming in of varki mm. you know so so you're talking to someone who was absolutely at the time when you know when all of this was changing mm. and changing to the extent that our lectures and everything was sort of you know planned by varki to to give us the inputs you know questioning yeah. indianness and you know all mm. of that and uh, questioning styles and you know all of those things so i i i think that would sum up the the mood of uh, you know the school of architecture from 1987 to uh, i think for the next 5 years strongly but post that uh, it must, I, must be know, longer now. they have been a little longer 10, yeah 15 years yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but let's telescope that ahead and now tell me it's 2019 i think what year is it it's 2020 i think yeah. 2020 uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, how 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 has your design philosophy evolved from or more importantly transformed from that way of thinking you know what have you learned over this time in practice and uh, what are sort of new not new sort of transformations that you are working on in your thinking over this evolution from the 90s to the present okay so i think you'll get two answers which are because there is a divergence i i'm i'm very interested now <laughs> <laughs> So, you have my attention <laughs> <laughs> so yeah um i mean th- this is of course um, something which i've been exploring and i think it's also a kind of coincidence of the kind of projects which come and maybe it's also the a point where personalities and uh, personal characteristics sort of Uh, how they deal with it, with the particular challenge so um, so having done from let's say a conservation project where you completely try to almost uh, you you try to be invisible to what you did because it's is it, it, that's that's the focus to um making of let's say public places where you try to keep things as loose ended and set up only a a bare structure of of things on the other side what has been my sort of increasing interest over the last 20 plus years is is actually about understanding um uh, society culture and uh, and all the other mediums i've had extensive uh, interest in um especially bollywood uh, 
not so much for watching, but I think only as a kind of an indicator. Bollywood? Make, Did you say Bollywood? Yes, yes. You're doing Bollywood modernism? No, I'm not. I'm just trying to explain from... I'm uh, going to build this as Bollywood games. modernism. <laughs> 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 so, so I was um, so I think every project I think I I almost have a different personality so I think that's that's the you're kind a of chameleon thing. is that what you're claiming yes I mean it's it, yeah it takes very different colors because it's not about what uh, is required for the project. I think it's actually to look at deep inside what the project can be. Uh, and I ask think not, uh, you're asking the brick what it wants to be kind of an approach. It's sort of still a very uh, rigorously Cobb Canyon perspective then. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps, yeah, that is too, too ingrained. So it's not going away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think it softens itself up from uh, in, uh, because it takes very different languages. Of course. Uh, it does have that structure. I think you were right there that it, it, it still has that uh, rigor hidden behind it and the discipline uh, of dealing with it. So, um, uh, so Nisha, yeah. so let's hear the other perspective then. How, 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 how has your thinking evolved since the 90s? Yes, I, I, well, um, I mean, evolved is a, is a nice, strong word, and I, I wish it was so. But I think my current and uh, preoccupations, which when I say current, I mean for the last maybe 10 years or so, but really, really now, uh, you know, very clear, is a sort of preoccupation with the land. I mean, I, th I think it's a, it's a kind of a withdrawing from, from saying I want to do a building, to really sort of uh, this, this desire to, uh, to look at what is essential, you know, to look at really what, it, and to just pull back and to look at how lightly. And so, so it kind of ties in with an interest in reflecting on ecology. Mm -hmm. It sort of ties in with an interest in, um, you know, looking critically at, at how to build. And uh, when I say ecology, I'm not just talking about building with, uh, you know, what are commonly known as sustainable materials, not in that sense, but really, really looking at the, the ground and the landscape and the terrain and, you know, just kind of um, uh, a little bit, you know, pulling, pulling back, pulling back to, to really explore what could be something that's essential, actually, you know, mm -hmm. shorn of trappings, you know, I mean, so I'm, I'm really in a slightly, uh, again, you know, I think it's the second phase of my practice. I feel that in a sense, and I feel like it's more an experimental mode for me to, to kind of pull back and, um, and, and really not define, uh, you know, so uh, not define so, so if um, I may push I you, I belong to a modernist or a, you know, so it's really to really explore. I think it's, it's a very, um, it's, it's a reflective thing. Maybe it's, it's, it's coming on with, uh, you know, as you grow older, you have, uh, you know, you learn so much more and you realize that, you know, and, and you I realize I, I how see, much, how little it. you know. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Absolutely. To, yeah. Go ahead to COVID. Yeah, and, so. and yes. And also at this time, you know, it kind of, gets uh, enhanced this whole idea of uh, you know really what's essential and how does architecture begin to talk about these things you know so uh, how does architecture make paradigm shifts you know how do we address and reflect on these things through the act of building on non non building so yes these are my current preoccupations <laughs> Let me, let's come back to COVID in, in one second. Uh, Nisha, I know you have a deep interest, let's say, in the spiritual. Yes. And how, how has that uh, influenced your practice or design philosophy, design thinking? Hmm. I, I think it's had a, a very, very deep impact because I, I feel a sense of, uh, I feel a sense of great accountability and stewardship to to manage the resources that God 
I mean, I, I really have had an encounter with this whole thing. We've discussed this before, but mm -hmm. but really to to uh, to be able to be a good steward of resources, you know, and be accountable to what we have. And I think that is also one of the reasons which uh, causes you to pull back and to reflect on um, uh, current structures, you know, natural structures, to see how much does one need to really build. And so, how do you critique things, you know, I mean, and really, so I, I think the one thing that, you know, if I were to pull back uh, from, uh, from my days as a, as a student, uh, the one thing that I'm still very interested in is really looking at things very conceptually, you know, deep down, getting down to the brass stacks and then, and then taking things on from there. So, yeah, it's, it's not a very linear process, but yeah. So a strongly conservationist, preservationist instinct, uh, rather than a transformative and constructive, you know, like a modernist, we know the vision and we can build it vision to a, to a significantly preserve and do as little harm as possible before you do anything else approach. Well, I mean, I mean, fundamentally, I, yes, that, that is a big part of it. But at the same time, I wouldn't, I wouldn't play safe, you know, let's just not, you know, do anything, you know, I mean, uh, I think at the end of the day, we're called to reflect on things and make those reflections visible through our work, you know, at the end of the day, you need to be able to point out to something that's deeper, you know, it's, it's not just about, you know, all, all our physical functions and, you know, how beautiful it looks and all of that. And, and right now, I think that in, in terms of even addressing Things like, um, you know, ecosystems or, or uh, you know, the ecology of water, whatever it is, addressing these things, we've already reached crisis point, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's going to call for a paradigm shift in looking at aesthetics and form as the fundamental, you know, and, and really looking beyond that to see if these other engagements with disciplines uh, and for me, especially my interest in ecology, can they give us new ways of doing things which have hitherto been, you know, not been considered? So I'm really interested in that discussion as a practitioner right now. And how is that discussion, um, as you were starting to say, how, what are your, uh, what do you think the virus, both the virus as the virus, and then the subsequent human response to it, which is this sort of unbelievable regimes of quarantine and the sort of unintended side effect of that quarantine, which is a time of self-reflection that has come out of it. And here in the United States, also the era of new era of protest that has come out of it. Yeah. <clears throat> how, how has all this uh, impacted your thinking about the uh, purposes and processes of architectural design? A simple question. Um, yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> a long one, though. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the COVID thing, I think I, I'd like to, again, bring it down to looking at this a little bit conceptually in terms of um, boundaries that have been introduced, right? Borders. So we're going to have to start looking at how does architecture express relationships? How does it express freedom of relationship within these new boundary lines? And these new boundary lines, COVID imposes a set of boundary lines. You know, stuff that's going on socio-politically imposes boundary lines. So we're living in a world with borders, boundary lines. You know, we're looking at walls in a sense and uh, safe havens within that, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think the fundamental issue that architecture is going to have to now address is some of these things are inevitable. So how do we break these things in a way that doesn't hinder safety and yet is able to, as architects or as poets, if, if one were to say that, you know, we're poets at the end of the day. Spatial poets. Can yeah. be, mm -hmm. yes. How, how, can, how can we allow for these suggestions and, um, and showcase that through our work, whether it's a landscape project or it's, uh, it's architecture, it's urban design, I think that's going to be a challenge. And there is the other whole thing of now inner and outer, you know? So I think it's going to impact, uh, it's going to need 
a change in some some typological work at a, at a fundamental level you know and i think that's where we have to spend our time because you know everything can be done in the physical but but really thinking about it and um, making these options available and talking about it i think that's going to be something necessary for all of us so what kind of a new social uh, you know nisha is talking about uh, the poetics of transgression is what i would say the poetics mm-hmm. of breaking through and across uh, boundaries yeah. uh what what does this look and feel like to you shomitra for me i think i, I think the the struggle has been of a, a it's sort of got highlighted i mean as as we know while uh, we reflect a very large you must be familiar with the fact of the migrants having to suffer uh, moving back to their own homelands um uh, and uh, having had some interest in um, reasonably strong interest in society and it's only to basically understand architecture i have um, i have felt it and for a long time but i also now feel very strongly that uh, architecture has been rather controlled that we have been sort of so obsessed with its um it's uh, it's responsibility to deliver and perhaps not to sound as a leftist because i take basically a middle position which is uh, i try to make sense of it is that that it has been serving capital and architects have been quite most of the time have been only tools of delivery mm-hmm. uh, or making that happen and it's a chain reaction now as as we are familiar that powers that control uh, whether it's the political power is is uh, has found new ways to uh, find make friends with capital and um, largely in a lot of countries becoming autocratic very controlling so i think where architecture comes in i'm hoping that uh this realization of a of a large number of people in society will uh put pressure of the need for for capital to be more human and generous mm-hmm. and that would then show in architecture in in its in its uh, it's it's like it will perhaps become uh good manners to be more generous and that would then reflect in Uh, architectural mm-hmm. design and the focus because i think that's what we have been losing because uh, policies have taken really a back seat because as um, i mean post independence we started with a very strong ideological socialist position uh, which has its, had its own problems and um, now capital is in different hands it has new partners in new methods new arrangements um so it's it's going to be a long struggle and it's not very different from when we were talking about sept it's 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 a different world it's a world which is changing uh and um, is uh feeling the pressure of 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 capital and uh, this pandemic i feel is is a strong jolt for us uh, on one side it has been rather comfortable and quite in some ways very it's a luxury to have had this uh, this time of of quietness um i hope that this idea of uh, of change because i i see that it's not a easy process it will take x number of pandemics and it will take x number of events uh, where there are whether we talk about black lives matter or social uh, policy change is very slow capital has very strong uh, on grip and, yeah yeah no no yeah. i agree i mean in, in, so what i'm hearing is is a, is a theme it's yeah. this theme of uh, confinement mm. separation structure control and its attendant not separate immediately attendant desire to break free to cut across to protest to see transformation and change mm-hmm. 
while at the same time also recognizing, as for instance, like you were starting to say, Shamitra, that yeah. confinement, in some ways enforced confinement, also comes with a certain amount of comfort and reflection. Yeah. So when you define things and enclose them very specifically, it can give you good intellectual and architectural structure. It can give you the comfort of home. Yeah. It can give you the clarity of uh, identity. It can give you the easy access to nationalist aspiration. But it yeah. comes at the price yeah. of singularity, totalitarianism, yeah. uh, loss of uh, freedom, Absolutely. loss of sociality. So the comfort that comes from knowing oneself and being confined comes with a certain loss of uh, the possibility of the unknown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think that I, I think that's that's I think um, a kind of a romantic notion of or um, it might be considered stupid from the other side that uh, that you enjoy the notion of the unknown, which is... Uh, and the indeterminate. Yeah. So I, but I think there is, um, so there is enormous potential while, while one sort of uh, is more reductive in nature. I think the unknown actually has the capacity to, <clears throat> to have an in, infinite horizon. The in, unknown Nisha is, uh, of course, the divine then, huh? Um, it's not that mysterious when you engage. <laughs> <With knowing goddess. laughs> and that's the wonderful thing, you know, it's, it's, it's not something far away and vague. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's at, at, at hand and you also brought up the poetics. And the poetics in this divine... Um, Uh, I'm, I'm wondering which direction to take this. Both would be fascinating. One is to get into a meditation of poetics and the divine with you. The other would be to say, to, to contest that right away and say, well, the virus is pretty unknown. Uh, and you could call it poetic because it's invisible and abstract almost. Uh, to us, to us, to us, it's abstract. I can't see it. I mean, it's supposed to be right here. I don't see it. Uh, and it's all pervasive and it's everywhere. It's very proximate. It's right here. It's probably on my nose right now. Mm. And yet, and uh, it has a, it can mutate on its own. So, so Nisha, you were talking about uh, respect for the world. Respect for the? For, for the world, the external world well, as made and given. Yeah. And like that includes the virus. <laughs> <laughs> We're not sure that, <laughs> that it is yes. <laughs> One is not sure of anything these days. <laughs> I mean, the world is also scary and dangerous, you know. I mean, it's the natural world, the world that God made for us in seven days or seven million days, uh, is, uh, is not quite the Garden of Eden, is it? It isn't. It isn't. But to answer that question, uh, uh, you know, it would it would go off the, the whole scope of architecture. So, but it's it's it's, I mean, in a nutshell, there is redemption, right? And uh, my study of biblical text, which is very very fascinating to me because it confirms across the centuries, it confirms things. But it's it's um. It is not when you read it as uh, from the outside, but when you read it from the inside, you know, when I say inside, I mean that you already have faith, you know, and faith is the thing which changes that, that whole reading of it. So I think that redemption has been made provision for, and, and to me as an architect and as a person living today in the day of COVID, that, that is the hope, you know, that you can, um, you can overcome it. You know, and if I were to be specific about biblical text, then you can overcome it with the blood of Jesus. It's as simple as that, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, we've had cases even in our family of, of, you know, miraculous healing. So from COVID. So I so so 
that, that's and a whole can, other discussion, but yes. But can architecture function as a kind of a miraculous healing through the poetics of transgression, as you were saying? I think so, Bikram. I think that it has the capacity to do that, you know, but it's a lot of hard work. And it's also about being able to use the tools, the God-given tools of sunlight and, uh, you know, just, uh, just all of those natural constructs which work together, to be able to use that and to understand it, actually, to understand it intrinsically and intricately. So now, that's going to be a journey, of course, because we're, we're constantly discovering. But to be able to use that as, as a tool, I think, is powerful. And in that, you know, when, when you turn around, you know, you just you turn someone around and at that exact moment, maybe the sun is hitting something else. And, and you know, there's just this whole burst of hope. And I think that's what we're called to do as architects. It's nice to be able to reflect and critique. But I think fundamentally, we have the ability to, to do this via the shells that people inhabit, you know, whether they're landscapes or buildings again, or, or even um, or cities or towns. So I think that that's a, that's a tool which is going to take a lifetime to master. But if we're smart, we can begin to do that. And, and, and that's what I hope doing with, with my work. I, I really hope that it happens. Uh, you know, so mm -hmm. of course, uh, the best architect is always in your head, you know, and by the time it, it gets built, you think, I wish it had, I had done this differently, you know, so um, it's a thing to be experienced. Shamitra Nisha has spoken about the importance of faith and many times I feel that uh, designing and believing in the processes of design also requires a certain kind of investment in faith. It's a kind of a faith in, 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 the, in, in the technologies of architectural thinking or the sort of possibilities of design thinking. Uh, from a rigorously modernist, I would describe it as a rigorously modernist perspective that you articulated earlier <clears throat> as looking at each project for what it is and asking, asking, asking what it wants to be. It's, uh, for it, it, it's uh, designing is a kind of a faith based kind of a faith, isn't it? Hmm. So um, I think first of all, I think if you're looking for Garden of Eden, then you could check in Arya, but it might, you might find it. Aryabhat? Aryabhat. Aryabhat. I don't know Aryabhat. So that's a, that's a fictional place. Okay, I'll, I'll look for it. Yeah. <laughs> You'll find he's, it very he's, interesting. He's being very sarcastic, of course. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I, th I, I think you, you, you sort of poked in the right direction. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I, I try to look at uh, <clears throat> the idea of uh, more from the view of more like a crafts, craftsman whose uh, who's devotion to the craft itself actually is a kind of uh, uh, honor to this abstract entity because I do not define it personally. So I find that's, that's, that's the way I take. So whether it's... Um, so it's about the process uh, in, in, in the design on one hand is the idea and understanding people and culture on, on the other hand, it's also the making and the material and the detail. And then again, dealing with people who are the team who are putting it together. So, <clears throat> so I think so God is in the details. We know that in, yes, <laughs> it, it is in the details. And I, was, I think, um, Devotion is, is, is in the idea of working on the details. <laughs> right, 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 right. Prayer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's our riyas, you know. <laughs> so, it's our riyas and we also shed blood. We also believe in yeah. the blood and body of the detail, <laughs> no? <laughs> yeah. So I, th I think in some ways we are blessed in that sense that we are given this uh, uh, um, uh, a medium which actually engages with people and and it has a very diverse spectrum. So it has a deep connection and yet almost inanimate. Mm -hmm. in inanimate, abstract, out there. It's a faith-based exercise. You know, it seems like some of these uh, epistemologies, these ways of thinking in architectural design 
mm-hmm. in some ways could be described as kind of a secularized theology. It's sort of like yes. a theological yes. way of thinking, it except is. that we have just made it architecture. It has similar patterns, actually. It yeah, may be a cut paste job, you know, with. Uh, <laughs> 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 Isn't it? I mean, uh, I think this is more like uh, Tarkovsky. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Tarkovsky was a deep Catholic. Don't forget that. Yeah, but that only got me. It was too abstract for the Catholics. <laughs> His whole point was to illustrate the nature of the divine in some senses, yeah. very much in nature and in sort of light. Uh, yes. Isn't that? Uh, isn't that? Uh, I mean, Tarkovsky, brilliant architect, man. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, sort right. of his dealings with light were phenomenal. You know the way absolutely. he dealt with light. Yes. Yeah. yeah, light and fire and uh, and and penance and rigor and perseverance and uh, quietness and monkishness and yeah i mean totally tarkovsky is the ultimate uh, catholic architect and also also structuring the whole narrative i think that's perhaps i mean of course architects have been very keenly interested in uh, the connection between how narratives are uh, unfolded um uh, through cinema <clears throat> because at least it it has sound it has uh, vision and um, um, certain things which architecture finds in common um, um, or the structure of uh, literature which is um, which is perhaps even richer because there is no form uh, and it leaves a lot of the form and the formation of the settings of narratives uh, to only an implication uh, or, or an implied setting um in in at some times so um architecture uh, is gets quite interesting with especially the, the direction sort of i've been taking is sort of it dips into various things so in some ways it is dissolving a very strong there is a very strong personal control but yet it is also trying to dissolve the presence of that control. That sounds pretty mystical to me. Mm-hmm. Dissolving control through control. Yeah, but that is in a sense the struggle. Uh, I mean, the sort of uh, we were talking about earlier, the whole point of structure is to be- break structure. The whole point of creative structure is to yes. break structure. The whole point of totalitarian structure is to control structure mm-hmm. and enforce it. I mean, and, 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 and these kind of contradictions should become should be for uh, should be visible to us should be feel correct to us if we yes. uh, if we think of them not as uh, uh, logical fallacies but as uh, uh, necessary uh, inhabitations of life right so how how you are you're living in a house built by yourself and you are having to live in it now 24/7 for for weeks on end uh, well, we have, we have a Haveli situation actually. There are three houses. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. They're next to each other. Between each other, yes. And and the road is the Angan, you know. So <laughs> we have to cross the Angan to from one house to the other. Okay. And yeah. So this is my space, which is my den with the library and the table, and I spend my whole day. <laughs> Nisha has another den in the other house. <laughs> I see, I see. So, so you have so like, <laughs> I love it, I love it. So this is how you do it, one but many, huh? <laughs> yeah, my situation is quite not like this. See, my I, I'll show you. It's like I'm sitting here. That's my wife's table right behind me. And Okay, okay. Okay. So so we don't have quite that uh, well so, distributed uh, range. You can't misbehave. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Show me so, have, so you have these separate things to misbehave. I like it. <laughs> Nisha, please close your ears for a minute. Let me just talk to <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, that, I, 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 I think No, it's it's it's, it's not a joke. It's not a joke. The whole point of life is to misbehave in some senses. Once you have structure, the whole point of that in some ways is to 
provide the possibilities of play. Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. Is it not? Because uh, yes. there is the poetics of things, but there is also the play mm -hmm. and the pleasure and the jouissance mm -hmm. and the sort of eros of life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Architecture is all about the eros of space and mm -hmm. wall and texture and uh, color and light yes. and, and all those things, isn't it? That's so right. how, how, how is your architecture held up as you are living in your tripartite <laughs> haveli? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, there are many different characters, actually. <laughs> yeah. Is it doing well? Is it, is it fun? Is it, uh, um, is, is it doing good? I think practice, um, well, for me, the projects I'm handling, Mm -hmm. uh, are on the drawing board still. So it hasn't been a problem for me because we're mm -hmm. working online. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I, I think uh, I haven't really, in terms of work at least, uh, there have been slight delays, but I know that they will come back eventually. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it's it's been a nice time to work and reflect. And I, I do recognize... So you haven't that, lost a whole bunch of products, projects? Have you have, been able to keep... Uh, lost a few. I think we have a lost couple a few. of them in... Yeah, in uh, primarily yeah. hospitality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so th that's, that's affected. I mean, it, it's uh, because patterns of numbers of people congregating, densities have, cha have changed completely right. after this. So... Um, the models will mod will find ways to modify itself. Like la uh, two years ago, I had done the largest brew pub in Asia, uh, which is a thousand five hundred seater. Hmm. <clears throat> so one, I think, one will have to wait and see for a bit as to what happens. But I think it's uh, on the other uh, on the other side. It's it's interesting because um, if I think it will definitely have an effect on. Um, architecture number one because of the the state of the economy is going to actually drive uh, a certain kind of better discipline and perhaps um, a leaning towards frugality from uh, as um, as an acceptable medium to approach aesthetics minimalism so that's uh, not minimal. I would. I would actually take it. Yes, it would. It would be perhaps we are saying it's less. Yes, but uh, I mean whether it's talking about localization because um, so far what I have seen in a lot of go really good architecture uh, that has emerged from India is is that uh, the idea of frugality has been about the aesthetic and and the, even about the identity is actually has only been about the aesthetic and nothing to do with the process or perhaps not even to uh, the the germ of the idea of being green in the real sense of being very local so so i think uh, individual changes will happen in approaches uh, which are sensitive and some perhaps uh, because of economic condition will be forced upon architects to react to. So I think that's where I see um, how this mm -hmm. might have some quite uh, substantial impact. So, so, okay, good. But let's stay a little more pragmatic. Let me first understand. So uh, how many people in your office have you had to lay anybody off or have you been able to retain everybody? And are you working entirely on Zoom and, uh, and, and whatever, email? So the last two months we have done pretty much uh, started out with a different format, a uh, different software, but then we moved to Zoom and pretty much run quite successfully. Um, no, so is that, is that successful? Is your practice impacted by working on Zoom or is it? Well, I think thing? there was, there was a parallel condition, which, which actually made it succeed better than normal, which was even better like, than normal because I was available eight, eight to 10 hours a day which I would be available on any normal day, I would be available for only two to three hours to the office. Because you're running around sites. Yes, whether I'm going to site, whether I'm doing meetings. So yes. Uh, yes. it was much simpler. Uh, so it was very productive. Uh, a lot of catching up was done. No, what we haven't had any how, how, How's it been for you? It's been good. I've uh, got a smaller team, uh, you know, to control than Shamitra, and we're doing lesser projects right now. How many uh, people do you have? 
I have uh, four people in my team. And I have throw how many in your team? I have um, eight. Eight. Okay. So yeah. go ahead, Nisha. Yeah. So, um, so we're working on multiple things right now, and they're all on the design board. Mm. So it's it's been good, you know, in in that sense, you know, because it, you you save time coming and going and travel and all of that, and uh, you're able to spend time when you have to. Yeah, where, where you have to, rather. <laughs> so a lot yes. of time on design. I mean, and one of the things that really has emerged is the amount of time that gets, you know, pointlessly wasted uh, running around. Yes. yes. Uh, you know, when you can do a lot of things by yep. home, there seems to be just a expectation <laughs> that, uh, no, we yes. must meet in person and everybody must be in the same <laughs> room. That's right. And, That's right. Uh, Right. You know, if absolutely essential, we can yes, meet, yeah. but you can start stand away from me and yes. uh, it's possible to do. So, in fact, that should, should be, uh, you know, uh, a lot of unnecessary meeting, uh, yeah. the yes. time, that's collateral time that's wasted. A lot. That's right. a lot. That's right. I mean, all my conferences and travel suddenly got canceled. And I was so grateful. I can't tell yeah. you how happy I was not to have to get on an airplane. Right. Yes. But yet I did a lot of conferences via Zoom, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We still had reasonably substantial discussions, I would say. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Perhaps we can. And I think that's that's the essential minimalism that Shomitra was mentioning. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that that we know what now. I mean, I think it's given us the time to clarify and not just us, but I think everyone, you know, to realize what's essential, what's really essential to do, even in terms of relationships or whatever it is, you know, what makes sense. So I think it's a sort of a, I don't know if I can call it a Gandhian minimalism, but yeah. I think work, work has moved into the house and uh, hopefully social um, activities will move into the public spaces and to a greater degree and work will withdraw from the public space. I think that will be nice that whatever time we would spend going for meetings, we, if we consolidate that and really have a really social time with, yeah. with friends, yeah. I think yeah. that would yeah. be very in enriching. That's right. Yeah. Meeting friends in person and doing work yes. on Zoom. I like that yes. formula. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Nisha and Shobhan. Absolutely. Likewise. <laughs> so, so nice. good to have these conversations. Thank you for much for being on Architecture Talk. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is your producer, Amelia Jarvanen. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. And if you did, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions on new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us on our website, Facebook, or Instagram. Thanks again, and until next time, this is Architecture Talk.